Their calls are extremely diverse, um, to the point that some of them sound like they are literally made from aliens from outer space. But don't take my word for it. I'm going to play a few for you here, and you can hear what I'm talking about. Um, we're going to start with my personal favorite, which is the bearded seal from the Arctic, and they make a trill call. Next up is a walrus and they make a knocking noise underwater, which is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. It doesn't really sound like it's coming from an animal either. All right, the next one that we'll listen to is a killer whale. They do more um, chirp and whistle noises. Right, and the last one that we're going to hear is a bowhead whale. Now these calls that marine mammals make can serve a really wide variety of purposes. So they can be used during feeding to either find food, to alert others to where food source is, or to maintain some social cohesion between groups that are feeding together. They can also be used as a mating display to attract mate or to deter competitors, to display aggression, or maybe to mark their territory. Um, and they can also use them for communicating with their young or between with their groups while they're migrating or just assessing the environment that's around them. Assessing these calls, analyzing them can give us this really interesting um, insight into the social learning of these animals, which is pretty remarkable and very similar to humans. So we'll start with the individual level, then we'll work our way up to the group and then community level. So at the individual level, some uh, marine mammals have been shown to have individualized calls. For example, bottlenose dolphins have these signature whistles, which you'll see there's a few examples of them visualized on the side there. And they'll use these when they're greeting other whales. It's almost like they're introducing themselves or saying, you know, hi, my name is Steph. And sometimes they will actually even mimic the signature whistles of another dolphin if they've got a close relationship, almost like they're calling each other by name, which is pretty cool. So next at the group level, calls can be used to maintain social cohesion between groups and they distinguish them from another group. Um, sperm whales in particular will make sequences of clicks called codas um, and they use these in a duet style exchange when they're talking to each other underwater basically. Um, and these coda sequences will vary geographically around the world. So in the Caribbean, they always use a pattern that goes one, 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 two, three. Um, it's kind of like having a family knock. So when my family comes over to visit, they will knock on the door. And that's kind of like our family's coda. Um, 
this is really interesting too because it shows us how animals can learn. They've had the same coda in the Caribbean for over 30 years of people tracking them. And so that goes to show that the older whales are teaching the younger whales how to repeat that um, you know, acoustic sequence. It's particularly interesting with baby whales because baby sperm whales um, have been shown to undergo this period of babbling where they will basically, um, very similar to human babies, they'll just make up noises and coda patterns and there's not a lot of consistency. And then as they get older, they will start to hone in and converge on that adult coda. At the community level, there's a lot of variation with calling as well, and it can distinguish really large groups of animals. So for sperm whales, you can have thousands of whales over thousands of kilometers that all display the same um, vocalizations in a really large community. And then within that community, you're gonna have some variation. Another really good example of this is killer whales. So killer whales, like I mentioned before, they live in these pods. Um, the pods can be divided up into clans that share some acoustic characteristics. Um, clans might not be able to communicate in the same way using those characteristics between them, but they'll, they'll be able to communicate between pods. And then those clans can then, can then be divided up into even larger communities. So for killer whales, you've got northern resident killer whales and southern resident killer whales, and those two communities don't really interact at all. Then within those communities, you've got three distinct clans in the north and one distinct clan in the south. And then within those clans, you've got 16 pods in the north and three pods in the south. So there's this real hierarchy that comes along with their acoustics. Echolocation is something I want to talk about before we move on to songs, which are pretty complex. Echolocation um, is used very functionally to detect prey and the environment around them. Um, but the difference is that it's physiologically different. So it doesn't involve that laryngeal sac. It's used by um, odontocetes, so toothed whales. And they have a very special area at the front of their head called the melon. And the melon is a fatty store that they can use to channel noise that they create with air sacs that are near their blowhole. Then the noise gets channeled out through the melon and it goes off into the ocean and when it hits an object, it will reflect off of that and they will listen for that echo. And they will listen for that echo using a fat store that's located in their jawbone um, that actually attaches directly up into their middle ear. This works really well for feeding though because the fish that they usually are eating um, don't hear at a high enough frequency to be able to hear the echolocation calls so they can hunt sort of on the fly. Whale songs are different than calls um, in the biggest way because they are only produced by male baleen whales during their breeding. So calls can be produced by males, females, young or old, but whale songs are really particularly for the breeding season. And they're not just random chirps and noises, which it can kind of sound like if you listen to a long recording of one, but they are actually as very organized and intentional patterns of noises. So we can break it down into a unit, which is an individual vocalization. And then those individual vocalizations are ordered to create a phrase. And then those phrases are put into a particular order and repeated to make a theme. And then once you put a couple different types of themes together, you end up with a song. Um, it's very similar to how when we listen to music, there's a chorus and then there's a refrain and then there's a verse or two, um, just maybe minus the guitar solo. So you might be wondering how long do these songs go? And that's what we call sessions. They'll actually repeat the same song over and over again. And the longest one that's ever been recorded was up to 22 hours. I can't even imagine trying to remember that many lyrics of karaoke. Um, male whales usually do this song sequence to um, attract mates or maybe to show off and deter other male um, animals from being around. Um, humpbacks have probably the most complex songs. They're really famous for them. Bowhead whales are really complex singers as well. But then there's other animals like fin whales and blue whales that don't have as complex songs and they're a lot lower frequency. So we're going to listen to an example of a whale song from the Monterey Bay um, Aquarium. <laughs> 